Hi, everybody. So uh, this is me. I'm, uh, I'm also from Torchbox. It's a kind of one-two thing with Neil and Meetant this morning. Uh, I'm the technical director at Torchbox. We're a UK agency. We, uh, we've been using Django since 2007, I think, and uh, we're perhaps best known for Wagtail, the, uh, the, the CMS that we made uh, we, five years ago. Um, I want to uh, apologize for my um, clickbaity title. Uh, this talk isn't really about robots um, or, uh, or robots taking over the world. But, um, uh, and in, in fact, it's not really even about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is just, uh, is, is a kind of, despite the way it's mixed up in the media, is uh, a kind of superset of, of many technologies, including machine learning. So uh, uh, machine learning is one, but also um, natural language processing, translation, robotics, and um, it's, it's, it's a big area. And, uh, but I do want to, sp to, to spend just five minutes talking about some of the big questions around artificial intelligence. Uh, I, uh, have any of you read this book? I, I really, really like this book by Max Tegmark. He's a physics professor at MIT. And he talks about um, these three, three phases, like three releases of, of life. Uh, the first one is uh, version 1.0. Um, this came out about um, four billion years ago, I think, and uh, this is like a bacteria or even chickens, and um, it's two of the characteristics, the kind of main characteristics of, uh, of release 1.0 of life are that uh, they are un unable to, um, to change their own hardware, their bodies, or their software, apart from by evolving, which, which takes many generations. And then version two, um, version two is uh, what, what uh, Max Tegmark calls the, the cultural age. And uh, with version two, um, life still has, the life forms still have this limitation of um, not being able to manage its own hardware. Uh, but version two is humans, and uh, humans have been able to, to manage to upgrade their own software. So uh, in this room, we probably speak you know, 15 languages and play 20 different musical instruments and have you know, deep knowledge of, 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 of many, many various skills. Uh, and these are things that we've, in many cases, decided to do. So uh, within our own lifetimes, we can decide to change the way that we operate and pick up new skills and then uh, you know, affect our lives using those skills. So, so that was a big change, version 2.0. And actually, there's a kind of side point that uh, there's also a quick 2.1 release which, um, which kind of maybe came out in the last uh, 50, 50 years or so, where humans are starting to kind of upgrade their bodies a little bit. So, um, you know, false teeth or uh, new knees, that sort of thing. But still, it's minor. Generally, our hardware only happens, you know, the changes are happening pretty gradually. And, of course, the, you know, the subject of the book is uh, version 3.0. Uh, and with version 3.0, the, um, the, this, this, this life form will also be able to, to manage its own software, but uh, also its own hardware. And, um, and once that happens, then you can get this really rapid, uh, really rapid development. Unfortunately, Life 3.0 is not human. Uh, Life 3.0 is, is, is the robots who, are, uh, who uh, will be able to upgrade themselves. And, um, and that's the kind of, you know, the premise of all the kind of science fiction films that we've seen about this stuff. I find it really interesting that uh, we seem to be right on the very cusp of this, this massive change between version 2.0 and version 3.0. So the first one, like I said, 4 billion years ago, roughly, and then 2.0 came out around uh, 100,000 years ago. And then this new phase, and, and I should say, this is speculation, right? So there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of um, AI experts who have very different opinions about this. But um, someone did a study about the... the the mean point at which, the, like the, the average point at which the experts think that uh, we will reach this thing called artificial general intelligence, where where um, computers are uh, are able to, to kind of have the sort of generalistic uh, general skills that we have, and the mean point is in about 30 years' time, about 2050, and um, it kind of feels extraordinary that we, you know, this generation is right possibly on, on the cusp of this this kind of like extraordinary change. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, uh, and also, you know, uh, is it, I don't know if it's a coincidence that uh, around the same time is uh, possibly the, you know, where we're starting to feel like the most immediate effects of cataclysmic climate change. And um, this, again, this could just be coincidence that these two things are happening at once. 
or it could be just a kind of replay of this uh, like apocalypse uh, messiah kind of um, fantasies that people have had for the last for many millennia. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about uh, apocalypses. Uh, I want to talk about machine learning, and uh, and uh, so just a subset of AI, and particularly within machine learning. Uh, I, I like this, this definition by uh, Francois Cholet, um, that um, classical programming, so I guess the programming that uh, most of us have, have, have been learning, have been working with, uses rules and data to produce answers. So we know what the, we know what the rules are, and, um, and we'll, we'll take some data, and we'll make a decision based on that. <clears throat> Whereas machine learning uses data and answers and you give it to a computer, and the computer creates the rules. I think it's a, it's a really nice, simple defin definition that really kind of triggered, helped trigger my understanding of this. Um, instantly, I, really, I recommend, if you, if you are interested in learning about machine learning from the kind of fundamentals, I really recommend Sholley's book. Uh, uh, he's also the author of Keras, which is um, perhaps the, the, the best-known Python library for, for machine learning. And this is an excellent book about, about the fundamentals and the, kind, of, kind of the basic maths. Um, incidentally, Scholle is one of the people who are skeptical about uh, the artificial in general intelligence. He thinks that it's, um, he can't see uh, the possibility of making the leap between these very specialized skills that computers have now and the general skills that, that humans have. Uh, but on the other hand, he's very optimistic about the immediate effects, that, um, the, uh, uh, the beneficial effects of machine learning. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this talk. And so I, I want to talk about some really um, practical and simple ways that we as Django developers can take advantage of this kind of amazing explosion of, uh, of techniques. And the first one is um, image recognition. So uh, some of you may have been to the, uh, the workshop yesterday on uh, computer vision, and, um, and you might have learned how to identify shapes in a, in a picture and, and to make... Um, uh, to decide whether a picture is, is about, uh, you know, matches a certain set of characteristics. But the idea that um, you could just get, you know, uh, a million megapixels and um, a million pixels and send them to a computer and, then, and the computer would be able to tell you what the contents are of something of any angle, even seven or eight years ago, would have seemed like a futuristic, impossible task. But now it's something that we can do in uh, about 15 lines of pretty cruddy Python. Um, so I've, I've built a simple Django app, which I'm going to show you, and uh, which, which hooks into some of these services. And I guess the, the kind of key point of my talk is that you don't need to read Scholle's book, and you don't need to have, a, have like undergraduate level maths in order to do this stuff, because other people have done it for you, and you can hook into these, ser these cheap services, which are getting faster all the time. I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm just saying you don't need to. So in this case, most of the work is around like reading the documentation and working out how to do authentication in different ways. Um, so we're just taking an image and posting it off, in this case, to Microsoft's service. And I'm going to attempt a live demo here. Um, so this is at uh, robots.tomd.org. You can try this later. And um, I'm going to start by... Well, this is an interesting image I found. What, what do you think this is? You're all muttering, so I can't quite hear you, but you're probably right, whatever you said. So I'm going to... Paste that in here and ask the computer to describe it for me. And a person holding a bird, pretty good, pretty accurate. Um, maybe, you know, maybe not such a, not such a difficult one. This is my uh, colleague Colin. Um, he doesn't actually, uh, he does have a beautiful red beard, but he doesn't have those ears. Um, let's, uh, let's try this. This is going to be a, a bit more of a challenge. A dog in front of me. Okay. I mean, you can see. I can sort of understand that. Like the, the bathroom sign in the back looks, it makes it look like it, uh, you know, it's one of those sort of classic bathroom selfie shots. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's done a pretty good guess with that. Okay, here's, um, here's a photo I took earlier. Django Pony, is it? A close-up of a logo, no. That's not, not accurate. This is a, a distant picture of a, of a um, rather nice sign. So I'm going to try something a bit, uh, a bit more risky now. Okay, take a picture of me. 
Click. A man and a woman. So that's interesting. <laughs> so I guess I'm not sure which one's the man and which one's the woman. Um, I'm going to try it out on you, Dan. This is the hard, for me. This was the hardest bit of the whole uh, of this whole site is working out how to get JavaScript to uh, understand different camera types. Right, everybody, wave. Okay. Are you also a man and a woman? Pretty good. A group of people sitting in front of a cloud posing for the camera. <laughs> All right. So that was image recognition. There's some practical applications of this. Um, one is uh, content management systems, and that's the one I'm going to show you next. So actually, this is a demo that I built of some code that someone in this room wrote, who I haven't met. Martin, are you here? There he is, Martin's put his hand up. So uh, this is, again, this is Wagtail, and um, I'm uploading a set of images from my, uh, from my machine. And, but this moves quite quickly, but what you can see here is that Wagtail has taken the title, now already knows the titles of these images. Uh, so that's my dog, a black and, a black and brown dog, Nigel Farage wearing a bow tie. Uh, this is some sardine heads in my sink. That says a white plate covered in snow, so that wasn't so good. Um, so clearly, you know, you can't rely on these completely. This is, this is not terribly accurate, and that's because, uh, again, I use the Microsoft Vision service for this. Microsoft probably hasn't seen, doesn't have many reference images of, uh, of sinks filled with sardine heads yet, but, it, you know, it will get better. But I think this is a really use, good way of using it because you don't need... Uh, in this case, we're not, we're not relying on the machine to make exactly the right uh, guess. We're using it to, to help us, to sort of augment the editor experience. And I think a lot of the time, this, these machine learning tools can be used in that way, as to, to currently to, to augment the ways that we're working already. Um, incident, this, this is not so relevant, but this is something that's happening more in the last, uh, I've seen more in the last couple of months, so as well as recognition, we're also seeing image generation systems. And some of you may have seen this site that, uh, that was quite popular a few months ago, uh, a couple of months ago, about thisisnotarealperson.com, I think. So here's an example of someone who is not a real person. And this is not, this is not a, someone like, this is not a computer program <laughs> piecing together different parts of a person. This is like building it up from the fundamentals, and each time you refresh, it creates a new one. And it just looks pretty convincing. Uh, you start to recognize the ways that it isn't quite right. So uh, generally, you focus on the face, but you can see around the edges there's something pretty crazy going on. Also, apparently, teeth are hard to, to, for computers to do at the moment. So you often get these kind of slightly weird central teeth. Um, uh, I mean, normally I would feel rude about saying that, but this is, this is not a real person. Um, someone quickly uh, afterwards made a this is not a real cat, which I'm happy to say has not been so successful. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the, the computers, uh, we're, we're safe from the robots for the, for the moment. All right. The next one is about sentiment analysis. This is another useful tool that you can, you can use to, to add up to, to augment your, uh, your Django apps. So, sentiment analysis is a fancy way of saying, what is the author feeling? And again, here's some, like, the, like the, the six lines of Python that you need in order to, to take your text and send it away to this, one of these services. In this case, I use the IBM's Watson service. Um, and I'll try a demo of this. So I will take some uh, feedback. And last night we went to this beautiful uh, Ethiopian restaurant. Thank you very much to the organizers for that. And uh, so I looked, at some, I looked at some of the reviews, and uh, there are very few bad reviews because it's such a great place. But here's one that was the, the uh, author was furious that they only took Danish credit cards. So we can try seeing what Watson thinks about this. So Watson has uh, understood that there's this, you know, quite a bit of sadness in this statement. Um, uh, there's a bit of joy, which is a bit surprising to me. I suppose the, the joy is the, the city full of wonderful restaurant, um, and it's, uh, it's analytical. Uh, on the other hand, if we take one of the many positive reviews, interestingly, there's, a, there's another one here which is positive and just says, except Danish Coast Guards, but there is an ATM just down the road, so you'd think the first person could have like, just walked down the road. Um, uh, in this case, joy is, is stronger. 
Uh, it's a bit tentative. I must say, I haven't been that impressed with the, uh, with the Watson scores. And uh, I've just, last night, did a, a second one using the Google um, tool, which is simpler. Uh, so Google doesn't, doesn't try and work out um, uh, different tones. It just says whether positive or negative, and it looks at magnitude as well. So, so magnitude is like the, the strength of feeling. So you might have um, a paragraph where you say, I really hated this, but I loved that. And then you'd have quite uh, high levels of magnitude, but, but the overall message would be neutral. And uh, so the Google results are, um, are able to express that. So what are some, what are some practical applications of this? Um, so customer support is an obvious one. So if you get a lot of feedback um, and uh, you want to know, you want to just maybe be, get a trigger when there's something that's like a particularly angry message so you can deal with personally. Um, handling fake reviews could be good or better bots. So, uh, you know, there's an increasing focus on bots. And one of the things that makes a, a realistic bot is if uh, uh, you can detect the tone of the person who's asking you questions. And that means that you're more likely to be able to give a... a kind of more human answer. We're using this at the moment for one of our clients, the Samaritans. They're, um, in the UK, a very well-known organization who help people in, in crisis. Um, so people, people who are you know, thinking of hurting themselves. And uh, we are, this is all done over the phone at the moment, but we're building an online chat service for them. And one thing that we want to do is, is to be able to measure, and, and I, you know, this is, each message is not going to be very accurate, but I think over time we, we hopefully will see trends and, see, and, and be able to and start getting some data that we hope will help them improve the service um, about, about the measuring the, the, the state of feeling, the, 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 the sentiment during this journey. Next up is entity extraction, and uh, this is really about identifying proper nouns in a text, which sounds like a simple thing to do, so you could write a you know, regular expression that looks for capital letters and tries to work out what your proper nouns, but it turns out to be harder than that, and you know, different languages have different ways of, uh, of, of handling, of, of understanding what a proper noun is. Um, so let's take some text from this one, and this one I'm using, again, the Google natural language service. And I'm going to take the first paragraph from uh, the lovely website for this conference. And Google's going to tell me what it thinks it's about. So uh, accurately understands that it's about DjangoCon Europe. That was, that was good. And that it's, you know, it's very, I'm not sure why the two communities, that's probably something in my code. Um, uh, there's a mistake, obviously, the, uh, the Django un Unchained effect. So it's, uh, it's identified the wrong sort of Django, which is definitely what we don't want. But interestingly, if we then include the second paragraph, which talks about Django as a technology, our conference values, and extract again. This time it understands that Django, this is Django, the web framework. So I've, I've pulled, uh, Google also gives you the Wikipedia links for each item. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's impressive, and that's something that would be hard to do with a regular expression, or hard to do if you were building the rules yourselves. It's using the context around the paragraph to understand the, uh, the, what those entities are. I've got some nice demos for this, but I'm, I'm short on time, so I'm going to skip this. Again, there's a content management um, tool, and we've done an integration with Wagtail that, that uh, tries to extract the kind of the themes from each piece of uh, each, each article, and that means that you can start allowing users to... Uh, if, if you're an editor of a website and you've got 100 pages, you probably know now, how those pages link to each other, how, what the relevant themes are. But if you are running a big news site with a million pages, then it gets harder and harder to, to establish the connections between all those pieces of content. And, but using tools like this, auto-tagging, using entity extraction, means that you can start creating this more kind of thematic, natural way of browsing. And the last one I'm going to talk about is outcome prediction. And this is the kind of the lowest level one. This is more like, like the basic tools that you would use for building your own machine learning models. And a, a way of thinking about this is just, it's, is a, it's a kind of prediction. So what will happen now, given what we know about the past? It's a bit like Scholle's rule, uh, his, his definition of machine learning. And you need to carry out these steps. So this is, this is not just firing a bit of, you know, your, a blob of text within 10 lines of Python. You need to do a bit more work. You have to pre prepare your data. Then you have to train a model. And then you have to evaluate whether or not that training is accurate. And once you're happy with its accuracy, then you can use it. For this one, I used uh, the Amazon service. And uh, uh, for the test, I used this quite well-known data sample. So this is about 100 creatures. And uh, we can see their names in the first column. 
and then we are seeing their, it's called features, with basically their, their attributes. So um, we can see that the, the blue is the hair column, whether or not it has hair, feathers, so on, whether it's airborne. And generally, when you are creating your uh, training set, you want to try to get the features in this, in, into this state. So, so you, um, where possible, you're, you've got binary, uh, binary data for each feature. And sometimes that's not possible, but th that's going to make it quick, easier and quicker for your training. While I was while I was doing this, uh, I, the, most of the work is around kind of working out how um, Amazon, you know, reading all the grim Amazon documentation. And I, I came across this uh, tweet from Vicky Boykis, who's uh, I very very much recommend following. It's a developer in Philadelphia, uh, who said about hottest programming skills getting info from AWS. But I, I liked like, the fact that uh, uh, I managed to include this in a conference talk about AI. So I felt like I was sort of <laughs> really really hot. Um, uh, so this is how it looks on AWS once you get the, the right features in. And then you create uh, a model based on that data, and you test it. And then you are able to demo it. So here's this is the last one of our slot. So someone, someone suggests an animal. Animal? A giraffe. OK. Does a giraffe have hair? Feathers? Eggs? Milk? <laughs> is it airborne? Is it aquatic? Is it a predator? No. I don't know. What, is it a predator? No. Yeah. Toothed? Yeah. Backbone? Yeah. Does it breathe? Yeah. Is it venomous? Yeah. Does it have fins? Yeah. Does it have a tail? Yeah. Is it domestic? Yeah. <laughs> is it cat size? This is a weird one, the cat size. All right. Let's see. All right. 98% confident that you're a mammal, and it's right. And um, uh, last time I did this, um, someone, someone's said, well, you know, that's, that's stupid. Obviously, if it's, uh, if it's milk, if it's got milk, then it's a ma mammal. We know that, right? That's in a kind of, you know, we don't need a computer to tell us that. But I think that's a really nice uh, example of the, the Cholet thing, right? So that's, the, that's the, like, the classical programming version where, where we know the rules. We know that if it's, uh, if it's milk, then it's a mammal. But in this case, we don't, we don't know that. We're just, we're just giving it the data, and it's working it out for us. But giving it the data is something that you have to be really careful with. Um, and this is actually, um, this is a really important point. So here, we can see that, uh, we look down the, the left here, most of the bees are mammals. Most of the, the letters, the, 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 the creatures that begin with B are ones. And, uh, you know, it's possible that the rule, that the, the, the engine could try and establish a pattern from that. Right? And um, this, is, this is known as overfitting in machine learning. And actually, it turns out you have to be quite careful not to let that happen. Um, and this, this, this starts playing out in some pretty unpleasant ways. So there have been a few stories about this recently. Um, you might have seen this one, that uh, Amazon, weirdly that Amazon would make this mistake, um, created a recruiting tool based on um, uh, AI, machine learning. They wanted an engine where you, it's going to give you 100 resumes, and it's going to spit out the top five, and they will hire those. But basically, but they quickly, well, not that quickly, they, they realized that the system was, uh, was becoming uh, prejudiced because, of course, it was observing patterns in resumes that had happened before. And this is you know, a general point that we all have to be really careful about. When we're training models, the models that we use are going to include all the prejudices and mistakes that we as humans have made in the last, in the last decades. And if we just give that raw data to the computers to, to make new rules out of, they are going to inherit those biases and those prejudices from us. So this is something that we have to be really careful about as we're creating these models. Um, this, this slide came out yesterday at Google Cloud, and it's interestingly, interesting to see that there's more and more awareness of this. So they have this fair aware idea that, uh, and, and, and each point of their machine learning, each point of their documentation, they're, they're pointing out ways that you need to be careful about this bias, which I'm really pleased about. OK, I'm nearly, uh, I'm nearly out of time. I'm just going to talk about what I think might be coming next in this world. And the first one is around reduced complexity. So this whole talk has been about ways that you can use these tools, which are all, you know, they're all super cheap. They're all like, you know, free tiers and then like a thousand requests for a few dollars. Um, but you can use these tools to start injecting amazing abilities, giving your, giving your apps amazing abilities. Um, but I think the complexities are going to come down more and more. So the Amazon one was the most complicated, but that's getting simpler and simpler. Uh, last month, Uber released this Ludwig tool, and uh, again, it's in Python. I mean, we're, we're lucky in Python because uh, because this is where all the action is happening. Um, and with this tool, you, you can just you just 
uh, provide a CSV file, and it will try to do the modeling for you. So it's kind of just removing all these steps. Uh, last night, Google uh, launched something similar, AutoML ta table. So this is similar. You, you just give some structured data, and it will try and do it for you. Again, I think if you're using these really automated tools, you have to be very careful about not uh, uh, imbuing your past your, your, your models with the biases of, of past generations. Also the generation thing, so we looked at image generation, but text generation is, uh, is happening too. Um, this is the OpenAI group who uh, uh, quite controversially didn't open their last model called GP22 because of their ethical concerns about it, because it's, it's too good. And uh, as, as an example, so they took 40 million articles from the internet, and then they start giving it some sentences, and then it, and then it spits out more sentences. And it, they give it the sentence, um, recycling is good for the world. No, you could not be more, more wrong. And, the, and then the computer came back with, recycling is not good for the world. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for our health. It's bad for our economy. I'm not kidding. Recycling is not, does that sound like anyone to you? Um, uh, you know, this is scary. And, uh, and it's, it's something that we need to start dealing with, is like, it's understanding the fakes. And, um, Finally, I'm just going to talk about machine learning at the edge. Uh, I think this is going to be a big trend in the next couple of years as well. I have a Google Pixel phone, which is, and it's got this amazing camera. I don't know if any of you have got this, but the, the most amazing thing about it is the night sight vision. Has anyone experienced this? And uh, you take a picture in almost dark, and uh, it seems to kind of reveal stuff that the, the, the eye can't see, and certainly the lens shouldn't be able to see. And this is a combination of, um, uh, of like computer uh, vi vision but also machine learning. So it will take lots of little pictures, it will, it will adjust for the movement in your hands, but then it will use a machine learning model on the device to work out what the lighting should be based on all the other images that, that the model has had learned from. And you come up with these extraordinary, realistic and believable pictures that the eye can't see. All right, so next steps. If you want to learn machine learning, I really recommend Francois Chollet's book, Deep Learning with Python. There's an amazing online resource called Kaggle. If you want to do something with machine learning, then I should just read the docs of these various services and build something amazing. Thank you very much.